enjoy the the good health and, and good weather too. Yeah, my weather. Yeah, it's very very nice. It's been a wonderful. Sixty three degrees mm-hmm. in my bedroom this morning. <laughs> Which is I kind of sleeping. It's kind of well, yeah. It, it'll, it'll get better as the, the winter approaches. Did you have the windows open and allow the yeah. air to blow through? Because yeah. well, fifty yeah. this morning somewhere in forty four. Yeah, yeah, forty four. Forty four, I think, at one point. Yeah, just uh, enjoy the crisp evening. It uh, feels very fall like football yes. kind of weather, right? Our first guest of the program here is Delegate John Hardy, who, as uh, Vice Chair of the Finance uh, Wing of uh, the State Legislature in the House was in charge of making enemies all <laughs> session long by telling people no, too much, no, too much. And uh, that had to be fun for a while. And, and then he turned his attention to, uh, by the way, running for county commission, which the T-shirt gives away, as you see John there. Good morning to you, Johnny. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you guys very much for having me here this morning. I appreciate it. And in this container, to my left, to your right, uh, would you describe the contents of this container? So I worked for two and a half hours last night uh, making some homemade Italian wedding cookies. It was my first attempt. I hope they are uh, okay coming from a guy who is 42% Scandinavian <laughs> making Italian <laughs> cookies for a true Italian guy. So uh, we'll see how the uh, uh, how that turns out. You so, know, the, the great part about this is I happen to have an Italian wedding coming up because my youngest son is getting married oh, wow. in, in uh, November. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, these look just like, them. yeah. Oh, that smells great, John. Yeah, thank you. Two and a half thank hours you, you did. Well, huh? I mean, you have to hand whip the whites and add the yolks back in. I mean, it was quite a process, you know, but I followed it because I, you know, coming in, giving Italian cookies to a guy named Rob Mario, you got to make sure you get it right. So. That's great. I just hope every candidate is paying attention. This is how you campaign. Well, as I told Rob. <laughs> that and the subtle shirt. Right. And the subtle. And, and I told Rob before we went on air, Sally's exact words was, if I don't get my dish back, there's going to be consequences and repercussions. So. And we want neither of those. <laughs> neither of those. So, so. so that plate is going back, baby. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, John, uh, first and foremost, if we could do a little delegate business very quickly, because the governor is back on the, I want an additional 5% state income tax cut train. And the interviews that I've done seem to make it clear to me that if you want to do that, you're going to have to start making some cuts somewhere else because the money doesn't seem to be there for that unless you're taking it from reserve funds. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the governor has really been has really been pushing for this special session and calling a special session. I, I don't know if there is the uh, the want for that from the leadership in either the House or the Senate. I, I don't know exactly where they're at. There's no reason for us to go into a special session unless there is an agreement. There's no reason to go down there and have a special session unless everybody's on board with what exactly we're going to try to accomplish. So I have not heard from leadership, you know, where the caucus is at. Um, we have not had any caucuses um, that I've been involved with. Um, there is an interim meeting that uh, probably just finished up today up in uh, uh, Petersburg or Parkersburg. I didn't go to because I didn't need to go to Parkersburg to see Parkersburg. I've seen it plenty of times. But um so I, I don't I don't really know where the legislature is on that. I mean I I would be for the tax cut if there if we can you know fiscally show me that we can do that we can do this I, and I think that we probably can. Uh, I don't know how much of this is the legislature, you know, kicking the can down the road to maybe give the tax cut to the next governor. I'm sure the next governor is going to want to be able to be um, efficient in cutting taxes and controlling spending uh, as as he possibly can. Um, so, you know, you, you don't really know where it's at unless you're in Charleston every day and in the game every day. But, uh, I can tell you, uh, I, I would be for the tax cut if we could, you know, show that it was fiscally responsible. Um, we tend to, you know, waste at least $800 million a year doing something. I mean, whenever there's money left over, we always find a way to spend it. I would much rather give that money back to the taxpayers. Um, I've heard that we need to put money into the uh, unemployment fund, which no one's proven that to me yet. Uh, Sometimes I feel like the Senate finance makes the, how do I want to say this? Sometimes they make the economics fit their narrative, their narrative. Yeah. So, um, you know, if the, if the finance chairman from the Senate says, well, we got to get money in here, then, that kind of drives the narrative. I, you know, I don't know if unemployment's really in trouble. I mean, for years and years, as an employer, we paid on the first twelve thousand dollars, 
and then they lowered that from an arbitrarily lowered that to nine thousand dollars. Now all of a sudden it's in trouble and it's moved to ten thousand dollars. You pay on the first ten thousand dollars. I actually think what employers pay on unemployment is arbitrarily low. I mean, because my I think my unemployment rate is like one point four five percent, and I'm only paying that on the first ten thousand dollars. So not that I want employers to pay more money, but um, it just an, it's an arbitrarily low number. So I, no one's ever proven to me that unemployment's in trouble. Now I know Senator Blair will tell you different, and we've had some conversations about that. You know, I, I hear that money needs to go into BRIM, uh, but you know, BRIM's an insurance policy. It, there's always unknowns with insurance policies. We could put money in it this year, and it needs more money next year. I mean, it, it's you know, insurance policies ebbs and flows. There's going to be claims. There's not going to be claims. And why does the legislature have to backfill that? Why can't the agencies that we that's that that insurance supports pay more into that. I mean, most of those agencies have special revenue. So money that they make themselves, let them pay more into that insurance policy. But if we took that equivalent amount and then instead of doing it as a tax cut, we did it as a pay increase for teachers that we hear are so underpaid and non-competitively paid, how much would that be for teachers? Well, a 5% pay raise is about $120 million. And a 5% tax decrease well, it, is $800 million? No, no. Um, I don't know exactly what the 5% is. It's uh, That's an Eric Householder question. I think it's about, I want to say $400 million for the 5% tax cut. Okay. So but I'm not so sure, I'm not sure on that. I think it's 100 cause I believe you take in two point something in tax revenues, personal income tax. Yeah. So 5% of $2.2 billion would be about a uh, what hundred something million? So maybe it's one hundred and eight. All those numbers start to run together when I'm not in Charleston every day seeing right. all those numbers. But we have about four hundred million dollars in our uh, our personal income tax. One hundred million just got off Merrick House. Okay, hundred million. <laughs> Asking you, shall yeah, we see? Yeah, he is the numbers guru. So a hundred million is what? Hundred million dollars is what do you mean? He's there are a lot of numbers that hundred million is the five percent tax. Decrease personal income tax. Okay, cut. that's that's who covers costs a hundred okay. million. Yeah, and, and, and a five percent increase for teachers is 120 I think hundred twenty okay. million for teachers. Yeah, but Eric has a good point and a plan that I've talked with him about. You know, um, you know, Eric's kind of my protege when it comes to finance. Like I, 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 he's the guy I go to. I mean, he is really a numbers guy and he understands the budget as well as anyone in Charleston, maybe better than most. And um, so. You know, we have a feeling that if we're going to put more, if we're going to cut that tax, then we need to we need to bolster our uh, the money that we're putting into the emergency fund. So if we're going to cut it by a hundred million, and then maybe another two hundred million into the fund to make sure that we're not getting ourselves into any financial trouble and strife down the road. So, but you know, I, you know, people are all over the place, and there's also there's this top child tax credit, correct? Um, that they want. I, I'm not voting for that. I'm not. He wants to address that as well. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not voting for that. He being the governor. Yeah, I mean, how much more? I mean, you know, we we want to pay facilities to for children that aren't there. I mean, I, it's a very complicated. I understand that there's a shortage of of child care, um, and these agencies don't get paid when the children don't show up, and they do have some base spending, and but uh, it's a very convoluted bill, and it's. Uh, costs a lot of money and well, John if I could because the attorney general is on next Patrick Morrissey who's potentially the, the next governor is it fair to do all of these things and squeeze them in in the last couple of months before a new administration takes over with a legislative with the legislature that will have more time to figure out all this during a 60-day session instead of over a weekend. Yeah, I think that if we were going to do this, we probably should have done this back in August. Now we've kicked, you know, you know, we've kicked the can through September. If we're going back in, it's probably going to be in October. Now you're really only two months away. Well, the session's pushed back one month because of the new governor. You're three months away from actually being in your real session. You know, Patrick Morsey is going to be the next governor of the state of West Virginia. Um, and do we really want to put him in a box? Um, but, you know, my, my point is if the money says that we can do the tax cut, I'm for doing the tax cut. Well, the trigger says you can do four. Well, we're going to do that. The governor says, oh, give me another five. Well, and the governor likes to just kind of pull this stuff out of the, you know, he, he doesn't really confer with anyone. He doesn't, you know, sit and talk with the speaker and the Senate president and the finance chairs and, you know, and him and Eric Tarr hate each other. I don't even know if hate's a strong enough word. <laughs> Um, Loathe. Yeah, yeah, and both of them are very strong personalities. They're, they're, you know, in different ways. But uh, 
you know, I, you can't just if we're going to go to Charleston and do something, everyone's got to be on the same page. You need 51 votes in the House and you need the Senate to be on board. And I, I just don't know. I mean, heck, the governor could call us in the session and one of the houses could go in and adjourn Sonny die and go home. I mean, it doesn't mean we have to take up the legislation. Let's talk about your campaign for county commission. We had your opponent in yesterday and this is our first time getting a chance to talk with you specifically about your race for the county commission now. Uh, tell us uh, a couple of things in regards to being a delegate and how it applies to being a county, com <coughs> excuse me, county commissioner who uh, is waiting on funding from the state uh, for most of the uh, cash you get in. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, it'll be a very interesting kind of twist if I am, you know, uh, um, blessed enough to win that seat. I'm very excited about that to make the shift from being a, a delegate on the state level and working on the county level. Uh, I, you know, my six years that I've been in the legislature, I've worked very hard for the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, mostly working to try to keep money here, keep money from going to Charleston. I've returned uh, with legislation millions of dollars back to the Eastern Panhandle. Um, I've been a part of legislation that has uh, really been able to be beneficial to the Eastern Panhandle, and I'm really looking forward uh, to using those relationships that I have garnered over the last six years in Charleston to be able to work uh, basically what I would say maybe on the inside a little bit, um, to be able to uh, address the many needs that is uh, that Berkeley County has, the challenges that we're going to see over the next six years. Um, well, as I said earlier, Patrick Morrissey will be the next governor of the state of West Virginia. I've had an eight-year relationship with Patrick. Um, you know, we we are very good friends, and I've had very um, uh, uh, frank conversations with him about uh, infrastructure, roads, and issues in the Eastern Panhandle. Just had breakfast with him the other morning at the Labor Day breakfast, and we we spoke about some of these things. So I think you know there's a relationship. I, I think that uh, I'm hoping that my friend Eric Householder has some thing to do in that administration. Don't know that yet, but you know Eric is a is a good friend and understands budgets and understands uh, the Eastern Panhandle's needs. Um, the next treasurer is someone that I have a relationship with. The next attorney general is someone I have a relationship. Not only those positions, but the people that work in those offices. So sometimes when the political uh, part of that office changes, the, the people that are really the, the, the bones of those offices don't change, which is the staff. And I've you know built relationships with those staff members over the years. Uh, the Supreme Court, you know, I, I worked very hard with the Supreme Court to bring more magistrates to Berkeley County. Rob remembers that fight. Um, I negotiated on behalf of Berkeley County uh, on our reimbursement rate for our courtrooms. Uh, we were getting a, a very low return rate uh, on our uh, courtroom space per square foot. Uh, so I did a study and studied what every county was being paid, and we were being paid at the same rate as Mingo County. So I negotiated, uh, I think we were getting $8 a square foot. Berkeley County wanted $22 a square foot. I direct, directly negotiated with the, us, uh, with the courts and was able to get us, I think we landed somewhere around $16 a square foot. So we was able to renegotiate those things. So, you know, those are just things that I've done. My excess tax reform bill is, is bringing millions of dollars back to the Eastern Panhandle. Is that at 100% yet, John? It's, it's close. I, I don't know exactly where we're at on the phase-in. Uh, it's it's probably somewhere around 70%. I'd have to check with Gary Wines. He, mm -hmm. he would know exactly where that's at. But, you know, that's when that's fully implemented, we're probably looking at $1.8 million coming back from that. That can be used at the county commission's um you know, whatever, it's really unencumbered. The county commission can use it what they want it for. We recently just passed the impact fee, which is, is going to be a tool, one tool in the toolbox to be able to help control residential growth. Um, if our growing trends continue uh, the way they are, that's probably going to generate somewhere between five to seven million dollars for the county to be used. Uh, that money has to be used for emergency services, police, fire, ambulance, and it can also be used for quality of life projects. So there's another piece of legislation that we've worked on. Uh, all this while being a fiscally conservative uh, elected official. We've worked to cut all taxes on Social Security. We've worked on the personal property tax. Uh, you know, as long as you pay your personal property taxes before October 1st, you will, re you will get all of that money back dollar for dollar on your state tax um, on your income tax either owed or returned to you from the state. So 
those are some of the things that I've worked on on the statewide. I'm very interested in working, you know, locally with the with the county agencies, um, and uh, and using those relationships that I've made both locally and at the state level to do everything that I can do to make sure that Berkeley County is meeting the challenges that will be ahead for it. Mr. Miller, what if I paid? A year ago's taxes before October 1st, I, I just, as you mentioned, personal property, and I'm going, wait a minute, I was just working on that last night and realized I never paid mine from a year earlier, so I've paid both at the same time. Does that get reimbursed, or have I lost out because I didn't uh, submit by October the, the 1st of last year? Yeah, that would be a question for the assessor. So I know as long as you've paid your taxes mm -hmm. by the October 1st, you will get your money back dollar for right. dollar. And I think there was a... A bill that you would have gotten only the second half back. Okay. And then we went to the legislature and did some retroactive legislation that would give you the full year back. So I don't know exactly how that works when it's in the rears mm -hmm. by a year. So you may have lost the opportunity for the one year, but you definitely would have the opportunity to get this year's. And there may be, a, you know, because it's so daunting of a task and it's so confusing those taxes are confusing anyway because they're a year in the rears mm -hmm. and now we've thrown this other level of confusion in on it if we just would have passed the amendment berkeley county and i believe jefferson county were the only counties that passed that amendment and i'm hopeful that that will be back on a ballot sometime soon to just completely get rid of the personal property tax so you could see that hopefully on on a ballot yeah you I believe. Mean, yeah I, I mean that would be a question for your upcoming legislature and you know the senate and and the house and and i'm sure the governor is going to be on board with that the last governor right. the governor we have now currently he fought that right um from the county levels because yeah. the counties were afraid they weren't going to be made whole we've proven to them that they're going to be made whole um and actually if that tax is paid by the first of october they, the state just lets the county hold on to it so uh, hopefully we can get that cleared up with a, a constitutional amendment. You mentioned earlier uh, looking ahead to the challenges that this county will face over the next six years. What do you see as those major challenges that we're about to face? Yeah, the number one challenge in Berkeley County right now is roads. Uh, you know, uh, I would say it's roads. Um, uh, the thing with, the, with our road system, where we can no longer be reactive with our road systems in Berkeley County or Jefferson County. And even in the Morgan County, the, the, the times of ditching and repaving and maintaining is over, right? We need to continue that, but we need new roads. We need larger roads. We need turn lanes. We need bypasses. We need uh, our road system needs to be greatly upgraded. Uh, we need to use someone talked about using side roads. You know, one of the problems for, to, for Hedgesville, I think 901 from Spring Mills could be greatly improved and that would help any traffic that was heading northbound we could probably pick one of those side roads that heads south off of route nine and improve one of those roads uh, maybe harlan springs or, or or some other road that comes off there that heads mm -hmm. south to get that to the interstate while we're trying to figure out what we can do from martinsburg to hedgesville um and from hedgesville to berkeley springs to, to work on that situation but i think and i had this conversation with uh Patrick Morrissey on Tuesday morning and Patrick understands, you know, the road system and, and the West Virginia Department of Highways and their inability to understand the differences in the eastern panhandle from the west, rest of the state or their inability to admit or at least address the problems we have here is going to have to be addressed by the governor. And I believe having a governor who's from the Eastern Panhandle, someone who who spends a lot of time here, you know, will understand what's going on here. And I'm hopeful that that will jumpstart our road systems in, in Berkeley County. So I, I don't know how to ask this and, and not seem, I don't know. You won't hurt oh, my feelings. Okay. Can't, um, can't hurt my feelings. The You're being replaced, no matter how the election turns out by someone who is far junior to you in in the state house and from what you're talking about to accomplish just in this roads example that has to be accomplished by the governor you're essentially talking about leapfrogging the the newly elected uh delegate to go have direct access to the the real power brokers in charleston is that is that what i'm hearing no i would not leapfrog anyone we will work as a complete delegation we will bring together the county commission we will bring together our elected officials our delegates and our senators and we will go to charleston and we will work in force and we will work together we will make sure that uh, our needs are known as i've continued to do 
I have great relationships with all of the delegates that are there now from the Eastern Panhandle. Chuck Horse is my roommate. Mike Hornby is a personal friend. Mike Height is a friend. Um, you know, I have a working relationship with Bill Ridenour. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm missing some. Bill will be on tomorrow, by the way. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, I have relationships with all those people. I've worked with them on legislation. Pick up the phone, give them a call. As the same as we can talk to any of the agencies or the people in Charleston that are that are working in those agencies. And is this common for um, commissioners to during the sessions to be up in Charleston and working the hallways and and talking to folks? Is I don't. This uh, unique to your plan. It will be. For, I mean, I'm going to do that. Right. I mean, you know, we see our commissioners in Charleston some. Uh, it's kind of a busy time of year because the commissioners are putting together the budget. So I'll be working on budget. But listen, I don't mind running up and down that road. I've been running up and down that road for six years, and I'm going to be a force in the hallways of Charleston. I'm going to work with, uh, you know, anyone that I need to work with in Charleston to try to make things happen for the Eastern Panel. And listen, the cogs of government move slow. Understand that. You know, it's, it's a team sport, and the cogs of government move slow. And they move slow for a reason. And it's designed that way. And passing a piece of legislation is not easy. And it's really hard to explain to people that have not been involved in the legislature how the legislature works. It's a, it is its very own unique beast. I mean, there's days where you feel like a hero and there's days you feel like a zero. How likely is it that in the transition, because the Eastern Panhandle has lost so much seniority in, in both houses, actually, um, that we're going to sort of be forgotten in the in the opening days of the new session i don't think so i, I think we still have good we ha, we still have good delegation from the eastern panhandle um, we have lost some of our power structure there but we will continue to fight and our economics in the eastern panhandle drives our voice in charleston we have an economic voice and you know the saying money talks and yeah. other things walk Right. So we're a driving economic force in the state. So someone's going to listen. And I, and I think having a governor from the Eastern Panhandle, maybe some people in his administration from the Eastern Panhandle um, is, is going to be is going to help us. Well, and the speaker has pretty much guaranteed that there will be leadership positions from the delegation of the Eastern Panhandle as well, though, that will be replaced. That's wonderful. Uh, he did so on this show. So, John, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for the baked goods. Yeah. We'll get Sally back the container as best as possible without the consequences. I'm, I'm hoping for no repercussions or consequences. <laughs> so thank you all very much for having me today. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming in. That's uh, Delegate John Hardy.